for the Feast of the Transfiguration, I'm going to read the vision that Jesus gave Maria of Altorta, which was on the 5th of August, 1944. I'm with my Jesus upon a high mountain. Peter, James and John are with Jesus. They climb higher up and their eyes rove over open horizons, the details of which are well defined, even in the distance, in the beautiful clear day. The mountain is not part of a range of mountains like the one in Judea. It rises isolated with the east in front with respect to the place where we are, the north to the left, the south to the right, and at the rear to the west, the summit, which is about 100 steps higher up. It is very high and the view extends over a very wide range. The Lake of Gennesaret looks like a strip of sky that has come down to be set in the green of the earth, an oval turquoise enclosed by emeralds of various shades, a mirror that trembles and ripples in a light breeze and on which boats in full sail glide as nimbly as seagulls, lightly bent towards the blue water, exactly with the grace of the flight of a kingfisher skimming the water in search of prey. Then a vein flows out from the vast turquoise. It is pale blue where the riverbed is wider and darker where the banks narrow and the water is deeper and in the shade of the trees that grow luxuriantly near the river nourished by its water. The Jordan looks like an almost straight stroke of a brush in the greenery of the plain. Some villages are scattered here and there on both sides of the river. Some are only a handful of houses. Others are somewhat larger with the airs of little towns. The main roads are yellowish lines among the green. But here, on the side of the mountain, the plain is more cultivated and fertile and it is really beautiful. The various hues of the several growths are a more pleasant sight in the beautiful sunshine of a very clear day. It must be springtime, perhaps the month of March if I take into account the latitude of Palestine, because I see the corn, which is already high, although still green, waving like a blue-green sea. And I see the crests of the early fruit trees decorate this little vegetable sea with something like tiny white and rosy clouds, and meadows strewn with the flowers of the high hay, where grazing sheep look like piles of snow spread here and there on the green grass. Just a pause for a moment. We can contrast the barren nature of that part of the world, Israel, Palestine, today, compared to its lush nature 2,000 years ago. In fact, if we look in the Old Testament, we see how when some boys mocked Elisha for his bald head, a bear comes out and kills them while bears couldn't live in an environment which had little vegetation. And in Jesus' day, which is centuries subsequent to Elisha's time, Israel is still lush and full of vegetation. In fact, somewhere in the poem of Man God, Jesus describes how Israel will change. And that's part of the curse that falls upon the land because it killed God's Christ. But here we have um, a beautiful spectacle that's laid out for us in a very detailed way by Maria Valtorta. Continuing the narrative. Just near the mountain, on the low, short hills at its foot, there are two little towns, one to the south and the other to the north. The very fertile plain extends particularly and more widely to the south. Jesus, after a short rest in the cool shade of a group of trees, a pause which he certainly granted out of pity for Peter, who clearly has great difficulty in climbing, resumes going up. He goes almost to the top, where there is a grassy tableland, 
with a semicircle of trees near the side of the mountain. You may rest, my friends. I'm going over there to pray. And he points to a large stone, a rock that appears on the surface of the mountain and is not near the slope, but it lies internally towards the summit. Jesus kneels on the grass and rests his hands and head on the rock in the posture that he will take also when praying in Gethsemane. The top of the mountain protects him from the sun. The remaining part of the grass covered clearing is in the bright sun as far as the bordering trees where the apostles are sitting in the shade. Peter takes off his sandals, shakes off dust and grit and remains barefooted with his tired feet on the cool grass, almost lying down with his head resting on an emerald green tuft as a pillow. James does the same, but in order to be comfortable he looks for a tree against which he leans his mantle and rests his back. John remains sitting, looking at the master, but the calm of the place, the fresh breeze, silence and fatigue overcome him also, and he droops his head and eyes. None of them are fast asleep, but they are in the state of summer drowsiness that stuns people. They are roused by a brilliancy that is so striking that it overwhelms the brightness of the sun and spreads and penetrates even into the shade of bushes and trees where the apostles are. They open their eyes and are astonished at seeing Jesus transfigured. He is exactly as I see in the visions of paradise. Of course he has no wounds and there is no banner of the cross, but the majesty of his face and body is the same. The brightness is also the same and his garment too is identical. From deep red, it has changed into an immaterial fabric of diamonds and pearls in which he is clad in heaven. His face shines with an extremely intense sidereal light in which his sapphire eyes are beaming. He looks taller as if his glorification had increased his height. I cannot say whether the brilliancy which makes even the tableland phosphorescent emanates entirely from him, or whether his own is mingled with the brightness that all the light of the universe and of heaven has concentrated on him. I can only say that it is something indescribable. Jesus is now standing. I would say that he is raised off the ground, because between him and the green meadow there is something like a luminous vapour, a space consisting only of a light upon which he seems to be standing. But it is so bright that I may be wrong, and the fact that I no longer see any green grass under Jesus' feet may be due to the bright light that vibrates and waves, as is often seen in bonfires. It is a snow-white, incandescent light. Jesus is looking at the sky and smiling at a vision that enraptures him. The apostles are almost afraid and they call him as he is transfigured so much that he no longer appears to be their master. Master, master, they call in low voices full of anxiety. He does not hear. He is in an ecstasy, says Peter, trembling. I wonder what he sees. The three are now standing up. They would like to approach Jesus, but they dare not. The light increases further because of two lights that descend from the sky and take place at Jesus' sides. When they settle on the tableland, their veils open and two majestic bright personages appear. One is more elderly than the other, with a sharp, severe countenance, and he has a double pointed beard. Two horns of light depart from his forehead and make me understand that he is Moses. The other one 
is emaciated, bearded and hairy, more or less like the Baptist, whom I would say he resembles in height, leanness, structure and severity. While the light emanating from Moses is white, like that of Jesus, particularly with regard to the beams issuing from their foreheads, the light of Elijah is like the bright flame of the sun. The two prophets take a reverential attitude before their God incarnate, and although he speaks to them with familiarity, they do not drop their respectful attitude. I do not understand even one of the words they speak. Just a brief pause again. Don't want to lose sight of um, the fact that, which I didn't note, I don't think, when I first read this a long time ago. She describes Elijah as being someone who resembles the Baptist in height, leanness, structure and severity. And it reminds me, as it perhaps no doubt reminds you, that the apostles are aware and all of Israel is aware that prophecy says Elijah is to come before Christ. And Jesus replies, Elijah did come, but you did not recognise him. And that Elijah was John the Baptist. So it becomes fascinating then to see how physically Elijah resembles John the Baptist. Now this is not an argument for reincarnation, there is no reincarnation, must underline that three times. But there's a sense in which John the Baptist is Elijah. Perhaps we can say the spirit of Elijah was on him or in him. So just having made that passing point, I shall resume the, the uh, description. The three apostles fall on their knees, trembling and covering their faces with their hands. They would like to look, but they're afraid. At last Peter says, Master, listen to me. Jesus looks round smiling towards his Peter, who takes heart again and says, It is wonderful to be here with you, Moses and Elijah. If you wish, we will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, and we will stay here to serve you. Jesus looks at him again and smiles more warmly. He looks also at John and James, a glance that is a loving embrace. Also, Moses and Elijah stare at the three. Their eyes flash fire. They must be like rays piercing hearts. The apostles dare not say anything more. Frightened as they are, they lapse into silence. They look as if they were inebriated, like people who are bewildered. But when a veil, which is neither fog, nor a cloud, nor a ray, envelops the three glorious personages behind a screen that is even brighter than the one that surrounded them previously and hides them from the sight of the apostles, a powerful, harmonious voice vibrates Filling the air, the three bow down with their faces on the grass. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter, on falling flat on his face, exclaims, Have mercy on me, a sinner. It is the glory of God descending. James does not utter a single word. John whispers with a sigh, as if he were about to swoon. The Lord is speaking. Even when there is total silence again, none of them dare raise their heads. Thus they do not even see that the light has come back to its natural state of daylight, and that Jesus is alone and has become the usual Jesus wearing his red mantle. He walks towards them smiling. 
touches them and calls them by their names. Stand up, it is I. Be not afraid, he says, because the three dare not raise their faces and are imploring mercy for their sins, fearing that the Lamb of God wants to show them to the Most High. Stand up now, I order you, repeats Jesus authoritatively. They look up and see Jesus smile. O oh Master, my God, exclaims Peter, how shall we be able to live near you now that we've seen your glory? How shall we be able to live among men and among ourselves since we are sinners and we have heard the voice of God? You will have to live beside me and see my glory until the end. Be worthy of that because the time is close at hand. Obey my father and yours. Let us now go back among men, because I came to stay with them and to bring God to them. Let us go. Be holy, strong and faithful in remembrance of this hour. You will take part in my greater glory. But do not speak now to anybody of what you have seen. Do not tell your companions either. When the Son of Man has risen from the dead and gone back to the glory of the Father, then you will speak, because it will be necessary to believe then to take part in my kingdom. Just another pause for a moment. We have Peter exclaiming, O oh Master, my God. And this is a, a reminder or an echo of what St. Thomas will say later on after his doubts have been dealt with, after he puts his finger in Jesus' side. He says, my Lord and my God. And that um, may seem to be the Jehovah's Witness say, well, it's an exclamation, although the underlying Greek is not like that. The underlying Greek is the Lord of me and the God of me. But it's not an isolated case, clearly. It's not as if at the end of John's Gospel, John is wanting us to, to believe that then, after the resurrection and the appearances, only then do the apostles see Jesus as God. No, they see him as God during the public ministry and very early on, as actually um, a careful reading of the Synoptic Gospels tells us. And as Maria Valtorsa's expanded information about the Gospels tells us. And in this particular case, just one example, Peter calling Jesus God explicitly. To resume. But is Elijah not to come to prepare people for your kingdom? So the rabbis say. Elijah has already come, says Jesus, to prepare the way for the Lord. Everything is happening as was revealed. But those who teach revelation do not know and do not understand it. Neither do they see or recognize the signs of the time or the messengers of God. Elijah has come back once. He will come for the second time when the last time is close at hand to prepare the last for God. He now comes to prepare the first for the Christ. And men refused to acknowledge him. They tortured him and put him to death. They will do the same to the Son of Man. Because men do not want to acknowledge what is good for them. The three lower their heads and become pensive and sad while descending the mountain with Jesus by the same road they came up.